Well, good morning. Nice to see all of you. If you have a Bible, would you please open it and join me in John chapter 3? If you do not have a Bible, we would love to get one to you. So just raise your hand. We'll get it to you eventually. If you'd like to keep it, please feel free to do so. If you'd like to keep it and give it away, please feel free to do that. John chapter 3. Well, this morning we continue our time of following Jesus together through the Gospel of John. As you look in John chapter 3, we are closing out the text this morning, looking at, uh, focusing rather on verses 22 to 30 and John the Baptist. If you're taking notes this morning, the subtitle of the sermon is John the Baptist and the Heart of Born Again Ministry. John the Baptist and the Heart of Born Again Ministry. Well, let me go ahead and uh, read our text. And then we'll look to the Lord in prayer. This is John chapter 3, beginning in verse 22 through verse 30. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside and remained there, and he remained there rather with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized. For John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing and all are going to him. And John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless... It is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. And the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must increase decrease. Well, this is God's word. Let's look to him together in prayer. Father, we pray this morning that you would capture our hearts with your word, that your spirit would do a work in us and among us to see Jesus, to embrace the heart that John has been given by you here on the pages of scripture, that you would reveal to us what the heart of born again ministry looks like, and in doing so, would you strengthen this body? If there's any friends who don't know you, Lord, we pray that you would save them. And for those of us who do know you, that you would strengthen and build this church. Lord, we need your help. Lord, we need your grace. Lord, we need your kindness and the power of your spirit and your word not to return void by, by transforming us into the image of Jesus. And so would you do that with your word this morning for us? To that end, Lord, would you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, and all of God's people said, amen. Christian, you want to help with the technology, brother? Thank you. What is the Christian life supposed to look like? Or specific to our passage, when the Holy Spirit causes someone to be born again, what does that look like? Now, if you just take a moment and you glance at your Bible, you see here we are in famous John chapter 3. Uh, we have taken now two weeks to traverse from verses 1 down through 21 the famous discussion and that verbal duel between Jesus and Nicodemus where Jesus speaks these marvelous and strange words that you must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God, that no one can even see or enter the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And that flows into that famous of passages, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. 
So our text continues flowing right into that. So, so we've transitioned into this new episode with John the Baptist, but these passages fit together. So you're supposed to have that conversation with Nicodemus in mind. And these beg, this begs the question where Nicodemus just wondered, how can these things be? And he slipped off into the night. What does it look like to live a born-again life? That is a question I believe that John the Baptist models for us this morning when the Holy Spirit causes you and me and someone to be born again, born from above, born by the Spirit, what does that new life look like? So what ought your life to look like? What does a life lived in the light look like now that it is no longer in the darkness that we've been reading of in these first three chapters of the Gospel of John. Does God cause us to be born again, to live lives the same way that we did be, while we were still in the dark? Or does, or does the Spirit of God give us new affections, new desires, new motivations, since we have new hearts and new spirits and God's Spirit in us? What does it look like? What does God do? Well, the answer, of course, is yes. New life in the light is meant to look different because it's now designed and empowered by God. That's because it is, in fact, new life, born again. Now, here we are at the end of John 3, and John 3, the very end of this chapter, not only brings to a close the first unit of the Gospel of John, chapters 1 through 3, it also provides a model for us of what born-again ministry looks like. And that model is John the Baptist, who we read of in this text. John the Baptist's role in the Gospel of John comes to an end here in our passage this morning. But John the Baptist is stylized as what the lives of those who will be born again on the other side of the cross after Jesus raises, John the Baptist on this side of the cross models what it'll look like for us on that side of the cross to live a born-again life. John is a prototype. John signals what happens to you and me and to our hearts when we believe that Jesus Christ has died on the cross for our sins and risen from the grave. When we believe in him, repenting of our sins, and when he pours out our spirit in us, it looks different. And John... The Baptist signals what my life and your life ought to reflect now that we are born again in Jesus. Born again, it's a strange Christian speak, bible word that we throw around so much. Are you born again? And yet, being born again ought to look much different than when we weren't. So with that being said... Our outline this morning as we traverse John 3, 22 through 30 comes to us in three parts. Here they are. Number one, all ministry is from God. All born again ministry is from God. And that's verse 28. And then we'll move into our second point. All born again ministry is to God. And that's verses 28 and 29. And then we'll close with this, all ministry, all born-again ministry is to God. And that's John 3.30. So, so you can see where we're going and what John the Baptist models for us. All ministry is from God, it's to God, and it is for God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, let's jump into this first point and our longest of points in the sermon this morning. Number one, all ministry is from God. Let's get our first glimpse of, glimpse of what born-again ministry ought to look like in your life and mine. Look again at verse 22. We'll read 22 to 28. After this, the episode with Nicodemus, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he, Jesus, remained there with them and was baptizing. John also, John the Baptist, was also baptizing at Anon near Salim because Water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized. Verse 24, for John had not yet been put in prison. 
Now, verse 25, a discussion arose between some of John the Baptist's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John the Baptist and they said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. Verse 27, and John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. All ministry is from God. When you look at this larger unit, that's John chapters 1, 2, and 3, the literary setting of our text this morning that brings this section to a close forms an inclusio. An inclusio is a very important word you need to know because it's a very common biblical literary device. And when you notice them, it's supposed to cause you to sit up in attention to pay attention. What's an inclusio? It's a common literary device, happens all over the Bible. It could be at a sentence level. It could be at a book level and even broader. It's when the Holy Spirit inspires the writers to repeat words or phrases or topics or themes that bookend a section of Scripture. So later, if you were to go and open up John chapter 1 and read John chapter 1, and then immediately read John chapter 3, you would notice all of these parallels with the beginning of John chapter 1 and the end of John chapter 3. Phrases repeated, characters repeated, and so more. And when that happens, these bookends hold it together and point back to the center unit where we saw Jesus' first signs, turning uh, uh, water into wine at the wedding at Cana, And then the promise of his last sign being raised from the dead when you destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. And then the promise of being born again. So this unit is a tight unit and it serves a purpose. An unknown religious conflict sets the scene. John the Baptist's disciples and an unnamed Israelite simply specified as a Jew. And they're having an argument over purification. And that makes us think of the purification jars that we saw at the, at the uh, Cana wedding. There appears to be a biblical misunderstanding of chronology and generational rank. That seems to be the dispute. In the Bible, older is superior, to which all of the seasoned saints say, So in the Bible, young people, listen, take note. Chronology and generational rank is superior. Uh, Think about Elijah and Elisha. Do you remember those prophets? The first prophet is superior to the second prophet. Abraham is superior to those who come after him. And there's it's a it's a very significant principle in Scripture. But as is common with all things, Jesus, Jesus turns everything upside down and inside out. So here, the, problem, the, the, the issue appears to be over some type of religious purification, probably baptism. But what this conflict does is simply set the stage for John the Baptist to leave the stage and allow Jesus, or rather put Jesus in his proper place, center stage. So in the mind of this Jew and the disciples, John the Baptist came before Jesus Therefore, John the Baptist should have had superior rank, superior authority, and a superior following than Jesus. But of course, we will see that's, that's not the case. And as you would expect, because it's about Jesus, everything is flipped. And it's how John the Baptist responds. It's, now, the Apostle John, writing about John the Baptist here in the text of Scripture... It's what John the Baptist says and responds with that reveals the heart of born-again ministry. 
where John serves as the prototype of what it looks like for you and me to live this side of the cross and empty tomb. And I keep referring to this as born again ministry because that should be redundant. It's the same thing. If you're a Christian, you're born again. But in the literary context, and that inclusio, all that fancy words I'm using, it's pointing us back where John the Baptist is showing us Nicodemus didn't get it. The disciples don't get it. John the Baptist is stylized as the only one who gets it so far in these first three chapters of Scripture. And he is modeling for us what that born-again life looks like, what it will look like in the future on that side of the cross. And so for our purposes today, the focus is less on what John does, but on John's heart. Out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart speaks. And it's what John says of himself and what John reveals of himself in relation to Jesus, I want to suggest are the very same things that you and I ought to say about our relationship with the Savior. So for our purposes today, the focus is on John's heart and the life that he exhibits being exhibit A for the life that we are to exhibit. And so with that, then look at verse 27. The dispute happens, there's an argument, they come to John the Baptist, and this is his simple answer. A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. Just just look at those words in your Bible there. Think about how exhaustive, complete, and encompassing those words are. This is not just unique to John the Baptist. This is the born-again believer understanding the -the behind-the-scenes reality of life. A person, so put in your name in this passage, you cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. Now, John the Baptist interrupts the argument, and he makes clear, we are nothing but what God makes us to be. There is nothing that we are, there is nothing that you have, there is nothing that you do that has not been given us from above. Think for a moment about what this says about God. Our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That nothing in us and of us is of us. It's of God. It makes me think of what Hannah sang way back in 1 Samuel chapter 2. In finding out that she was with child, she sang a song. And here's what she sang in verses 6 through 8. Listen to this parallel passage to what John is saying about God's jurisdiction in life. First Samuel 2, beginning in verse 6, she sings, Hannah does, the Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol, the grave, and he raises up. Verse 7, the Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low, that is, humbles, and he exalts. Verse 8, the Lord raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. Death and life, the grave and resurrection, poverty and riches, a low estate and an exalted estate, those are the Lord's, Hannah sings. Or or how about what the Apostle Paul says, now jumping forward in, in 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Listen to these words that ought to hang as a glorious banner over your life. What do you have, 1 Corinthians 4, 7, what do you have that you did not receive? 
And if then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? It's interesting that in the book of Proverbs, you have the righteous and the wicked. You have the wise and the fool. And there is the, um, there is the wise poor man and the foolish poor man. There is the wise rich man and the foolish, foolish rich man and so on. But their wisdom and folly are grounded in whether they fear the Lord and recognize that their poverty or riches are ultimately from the Lord. Life and death are from the Lord. A low, humble estate or an exalted estate, uh, public prominence or pub public private life are from the Lord. What do you have that you did not receive? And why then do you boast as if you did not receive it? Because the temptation is to think that maybe a elevated estate or a position of prominence at work or at school or, or whatever your deal is, it's, it's our proclivity is to take credit for ourselves. And what John the Baptist is showing is that the prototype of born-again ministry is that any estate we have, meaning wealth or wisdom or whatever, is from the Lord. And therefore, all boasting in and of ourselves is removed from ourselves. Now, scripture is clear that, that the Holy Spirit gifts us the time that you have, the talent, the treasure, the skill set, the intellect, the ability, the opportunity. Everything that we have is from the Lord. And therefore, we don't take credit. Even what we are, even the hard work that you have done in your life to perhaps achieve certain milestones or circumstances or vocations, it's ultimately the Lord who gets the credit for giving you the wisdom, strength, and power to receive those things. These passages, what's, what Hannah sings in 1 Samuel, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, these passages and many, many, many others in Scripture testify a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. That means, dear friends, that you can have a remarkable and shocking degree of contentment in your life. Because your life is from God. Both the sweet providences and the bitter providences. That God works in and through the sinful acts of people. God works in and through all things to accomplish His gospel purposes in your life. But we live in a society, a consumeristic society, a, a sexualized society, a society that gives ideals that are not biblical ideals of what a best life looks like. And we become enamored by those and distracted by those unbiblical ideas. But friends, recognize that you can trust the mighty hand of a good God in your life. Now, that does not give permission for sin to sin, and it doesn't give permission for us to be lazy or lackadaisical or to be fools. No, we have responsibility in our lives. We talked about it last week, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and work according to His good pleasure. Read the book of Philippians. But what I want you to see, dear Christian, is this. Have you reminded yourself of this glorious reality lately? Because the dark side, or one of the dark sides of taking credit and boasting in our own lives is we don't achieve what we want to achieve or be who we want to be or we, we think that our spouse isn't who our spouse ought to be and we begin to have this discontentment. But now we recognize you can't receive anything. Your ministry, we can't receive anything unless it's been given from God. Which means that you can trust the Lord's hand in your life to work out His gospel purposes in the good and in the hardship, in the sickness and in the health. So friend, what are you that the Holy Spirit is not making you to be? What do you have in your life 
that is not a gift for you to steward because it's ultimately God's. You are not your own. Your money is not your own. Your possessions are not your own. Your family is not your own. Your education is nothing you have is your own. It's Christ's. What boast do you have other than this? That God so loved the world that he set his love on you in his son. That Jesus, God, the second person of the Trinity, became flesh in his life, death, and resurrection, in the empowerment, empowerment of his spirit. That is our boast. A God who loves us and saves us and empowers us and indwells us. So the Christian life then is not meant to be a wasted life or a wasting away life. The Christian life is designed to model the life of the Trinity, an overflowing, other-oriented life of joy, and that is the highest of privileges. Because John the Baptist was decreasing so that Christ would increase, and all the prestige and power and authority and prominence that John the Baptist deserved in that culture he gladly jettisoned from him so that he could give it all to Christ. Is that you? Is that your life? Do you consider it the highest of privileges knowing that you have received nothing but what has been given to you from heaven? John the Baptist was given a stewardship. That's one way the New Testament defines our lives. A stewardship. Meaning that Everything we are, even ourselves, I don't belong to me. I belong to Christ. And therefore, I steward myself and all that Christ has given me for Christ and His glory and more. John the Baptist was given a stewardship to prepare the way of Christ by calling people to repentance. Notice that John the Baptist was not a volunteer. He was a slave. John the Baptist did not clock in and clock out as he saw fit. God had given him a ministry, and the sum total of his life was for that ministry. As a steward, every moment and part of his life was for God. A person cannot receive one thing unless it's given him from heaven. Friends, this is no different for you and I. As a born-again Christian bought by the precious blood of Christ, empowered by Jesus' valiant resurrection and outpouring of His Spirit, you are a steward of yourself, your family. You are a steward of this church. If you are part of this church, this church is your church. And you are responsible for this body. We are stewards of one another. We are stewards of the gospel for an unsaved society outside these walls, rapidly changing culturally and rapidly confused. Is this not what the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 6? You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Do you believe that? Until, friends, you believe that, you will not be living the fullness of what that born-again ministry looks like. Those of us who have been born again and live recognize that we are not our own. I do not belong to me. I do not have rights over myself. Jesus does. Now, Jesus, uh, it's been said that if you're a Christian, you're doubly bought. All human beings... Uh, belong to God because God has made all human beings. Christ has. And we are doubly bought because not only have we been made by Jesus, we've been purchased by Jesus through His blood on the cross. But this truth, you are not your own, lay that over all of the cultural rhetoric of our moment and all belief systems and everything. We are not free to do what is right in our own eyes. And for the born-again Christian, that is just simply a Christian, we have the privilege and joy of recognizing 
I don't have to pull myself up by my bootstraps. I do not have to do this on my own because it's Christ and Him in me and His glory and the power of His resurrection and the shining wonder of His gospel that I get to be an emblem of in this world because He hasn't brought me home yet. It is our joy to say, I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. And our temptation and our danger is to live lives as if we are not bought with a price. Maybe you feel bought with a price on Sunday because you go to church. But maybe not on Monday. Maybe you don't feel like you've been bought with a price in how you handle your calendar or your bank account. Maybe you don't feel like you've been bought with a price when it comes to opportunities to serve a church in needs like we have in children's ministry. Someone else can take care of that. Someone else is not taking care of that. Over 75 kids still not meeting because we are not taking care of our children. That's a problem. Our temptation and danger is to live life as if we're not bought with a price, as if we're not stewards of all that we have and are, as if we are our own masters. We are not masters of our own fate. We are not captains of our own ship. We are not our own, you are not our own, and that is glorious gospel truth. Because there is a Savior who loves to save us, has saved us, keeps us saved, and will move us across that finish line into glory. You are not your own. You have not received one thing that has not been given you from heaven. Do you believe that? Does that taste good in your mouth to say those words? The opportunity for you to completely humble yourself under the mighty hand of God is the most freeing thing a human being can ever engage in because then God exalts us in due time. Do you live like that is true that you've been bought with a price? Uh, I think of 1 Peter chapter 4, one of the many, many passages that speak of this theme. 1 Peter 4.10, as each has received a gift, Peter says. So gifts of the Spirit, your natural talent, uh, everything that is in us is from the Spirit. So sometimes parsing out what's a natural gift and what's not is kind of a fruitless endeavor. Everything is from the Lord. And here, 1 Peter 4 says, As each has received a gift, go bury it in the ground and hoard it for yourself. Oh, you've read that before. Can't pull that one past you guys. 1 Peter 4.10, As each has has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's varied grace. Uh, Low-hanging fruit on this. I I spend a week working on the sermon and I just stay home and stand in front of the mirror and just preach to myself. That would be weird. There's, There's gifts that were given the whole body of Christ. And it's, it's, it's not just the things that are easy for us to do and convenient for us to do. It's the hard things for us to do and the inconvenient things for us to do. That every single, if you are a Christian, if you're born again, a born again ministry means that we have gifts and gifts. And the reason we have them is not to be hoarders and use them for ourselves. It is to use all that we are like the Trinity in service to others. And he says, as good stewards. So I'm going to read into the text and might say say that you are a bad steward of God's varied grace if you're not using all that you are to first build up your church family and second, to go out of these walls and to help other people know and follow Jesus Christ. So John the Baptist, self-understanding, this religious unknown argument that takes place, sets this stage was for John's proclamation of understanding that he was nothing, John the Baptist had nothing, but what God had graced him with, how about you? 
Our stewardship is about service to others. And the more other-oriented we become, the more we reflect our triune God who is entirely other-oriented within himself. So we are born again with towels around our waists. Like Christ, so to speak, that we are prepared to do what is necessary to bless and build the body of Christ. That involves adding people to the body of Christ by preaching the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and calling them to repentance. And it is also about building up one another in Christ. All you have and are is from God, and he intends you to steward your life in recognition of that which John the Baptist models for us. You must embrace, dear friend, that all of life, all of ministry is from God. And we get the privilege, the sheer privilege in being willing instruments in the hands of our Redeemer for his kingdom purposes and plans. A person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given him from above. Well, that's the longest point, and that leads to the second one, then. If all ministry is from God, it doesn't end there. All ministry is to God. Look at the next thing that John says in verse 29. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, John the Baptist says, this joy of mine is now complete. All ministry is to God. John uses this rich biblical metaphor where now he refers to himself as the best man. That's, that's what he's saying when he's talking about being the friend of the bridegroom, that he's the best man to Jesus. And, and his job was not only to sort of, uh, so to speak, prepare Jesus for the wedding that's coming, but to prepare the bride for the wedding that's coming, to organize the entire wedding party, as it were. And we looked in detail back in the beginning of John 2 of what it means that Jesus is the true bridegroom. The emphasis here is John's relationship to the groom as the best man. And John uses this metaphor of marriage to clear up further the misunderstanding that was brought to him. But look at what he says. Look at that last sentence there in your Bible. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. Listen, John's joy is to hear Christ's voice. And John's joy is to bring people to Jesus. On that side of the cross, John the Baptist was preparing the way for people to come to the cross, as it were, to see Christ exalted and enthroned. Now, this side of the cross, we point people back to the finished work of Christ and his resurrection. The principle here I see is that all ministry is not only from God, but all ministry is ultimately to God. Meaning, the stewardship of our relationships with unbelieving family and unbelieving friends is to call them to faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, to trust His work and His death for their sins, and to trust Him for their salvation. This means the stewardship of our relationships within our church family is to speak the truth of the gospel to another in love, building up our church family into Christ's likeness. John's joy was to bring people to Jesus and see them meet Jesus. That's what he was about. All he said and did was, was fueled and funneled through that one joy to see people meet Jesus. So it's in that sense, John received everything from heaven and is now turning that back to use all of it to bring people back to heaven, as it were, back to Christ. And that means for you and me, in this sense, all ministry, all of life, all of service, all of meeting practical needs, all of applying the gospel to all of life, all of ministry, your 
whole life, born again ministry, is to help people know and follow Jesus. It's that simple. What's the purpose of your life? What's the mission of your life? Why are you still here? Why have you not been brought to glory? Because Jesus intends wherever someone is at, whether they're an unbeliever or a believer, young or old, whoever it is, you come to that person, you discern where they're at in relation to Christ and help them take those next steps towards Christ or in Christ. And since the gospel is meant to both make and shape Christians, you're on good grounds to just simply be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and applying it to all of life. It's that simple. It doesn't matter who they are. You discern where they are and help them know Jesus and follow Jesus. John had the amazing gift in redemptive history on that side of the cross to be the forerunner of those of Jesus Christ. And those of us who've been born again, we have a very similar call that John the Baptist had. Do you, do you see that? Well, do you remember what Jesus told us to do before he ascended into heaven? Matthew 28 and Acts 1. Go into all the world, all nations, make disciples of all nations. That is, plant and build local churches. It's the same thing. John's joy was rooted in other people's joy in Jesus. Let me say that again. John the Baptist's joy was rooted in other people's joy in Jesus. It made John happy, although he could have had all prominence to give away all prominence to Christ and simply be a pointer saying, no, 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 look to Jesus. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's the one who causes us to be born again. He's the one who pours out his spirit. Look to Jesus. And so John's joy in hearing Jesus' voice was seeing other people's joy in Jesus. That's another way that John the Baptist models born-again ministry. Just like the Trinity, it was an other-oriented in joy. John cared more about others and their joy in Jesus than himself. But then you see the relationship. The more joy that he saw in others had in Jesus, his joy increased. That's the exact same thing. Read all of the Apostle Paul's letters, and it's the same thing with him. The heart of the Christian is to have a heart that focuses on other people's joy in Jesus, and that you live your life doing all you can to cultivate and stoke that joy in Jesus and others. You see, we're not only recipients of gospel grace, we become participants in heralding the gospel, preaching the good news, and modeling lives that live in the light, that have been born again, empowered by the good news. And in doing so, we live compelling lives. We become a compelling community that's magnetic, drawing people to joy in Jesus. If you're a Christian, Jesus has not brought you home because there is still purpose and joy for you this side of the cross. Friends, I think Scripture is pointing us here in this model of John the Baptist that we ought to be hungry. Whoever you are, wherever you are, if you're a believer, using all that you are to help cultivate joy in others. Joy in Jesus, specifically. Walking in the light as He is in the light. And so you are not in glory yet means this is the task set before you. And if you're not a follower of Christ, it's, it's here, especially here, that I want to invite you to pause and consider what John the Baptist is saying about Jesus. He refers to Jesus as the bridegroom. One of the highest metaphors, and Scripture uses many, but one of the highest metaphors to describe what we Christians believe why we have assembled, what happens to us when Jesus rescues us and saves us, one of the highest metaphors Scripture uses is marriage. Marriage. Marriage as the ideal as it was intended to be, not the way it's portrayed in songs we sing and shows we watch and maybe the family that you were raised in and maybe the marriage that you have now. 
But the metaphor of Scripture is a, is, a, is a marriage, that salvation is a union with God in such a way that it's the highest bliss and intimacy, closeness, security, wonder, and joy. John uses this metaphor, my friend, for you to understand that one of the reasons that we Christians are so enamored with Jesus Christ is because he's described as the bridegroom and the universal church as his bride. And so in there is an invitation. There is an invitation for you to come to Christ, to repent of your sins, to see his blood spilt on the cross for you, risen from the grave, and to believe that there is something exquisitely better than all that you're trying to find in this world, and that exquisitely better thing is in Christ himself. So if I invite you to come to Jesus. And this leads then to our final point. In brief, all ministry is for God. It's from God. It's to God in cultivating other people's joy in Jesus. And now lastly, number three, and briefly, all ministry is for God. Look at verse 30. John simply closes with these, his final words here in the gospel account. He, Jesus, must increase, but I must decrease. And here we get to the heart of true ministry. All ministry is ultimately for the fame of God's name. This passage is not to be misunderstood, as it was misunderstood in the circles that I got saved in. And as is common... A strange biblical idea, rather unbiblical idea. Let me just want to address this because this is, I, some of you may, this might be tangled in your thinking. You read this passage, he must increase, but I must decrease. And there is a unbiblical idea that floats around that what this means is that somehow I kind of get absorbed into the universe. I keep decreasing, 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 decreasing until I lose my personhood and I lose my identity, and I stop being me, and I am decrease until I cease to exist or somehow absorbed into God. That's common in some charismatic and Pentecostal circles. That is not what this teaches. That's strange New Age uh, pseudo-Buddhist theology being baptized and snuck into Christianity. That's not what John is talking about here when he says this. Now, what John is saying about the heart of born-again ministry, on the one hand, he's making a theological statement. A salvation historical shift is taking place from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. And so he is speaking of the Old Covenant coming to a close, of which he was the greatest prophet of it, and the New Covenant opening, as it were, in Christ. But on the other hand, John the Baptist is also speaking about prominence, and fame. So what, is, what, does he, what does he mean here? He must, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. Uh, it's like the moon reflecting the sun. The moon doesn't create its light. The sun merely shines on the moon and the moon reflects its light. And so with all the prominence that John had, he wanted to decrease to make Christ famous with his life. So not only did John recognize that everything was from God, not only did it was everything to God in cultivating joy in others, but ultimately John was so passionate about God become flesh, so thankful for a Savior who actually saves, a Savior who loves, that John the Baptist wanted Jesus to get all the fame, all the adoration, all the credit, all the glory, all the praise in his life. That's what it means that he must increase and I must decrease. Is that you? Do all of your likes on social media and all of your postings on social media are meant to draw attention to and magnify the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or are you drawing attention to yourself? The passage is about the prominence and preeminence of Jesus. Not I, but Christ in me. 
That's what it means for you to decrease and Jesus to increase. It means that you live boldly for Christ, preaching Jesus' good news, calling others to repent and to believe, speaking the truth and love to fellow saints, calling sin, sin, rescuing people from sin, as it were, by telling them of the grace of the gospel, living a life that magnetically draws and pushes people to Jesus, never clocking out, always staying clocked in for Jesus being famous in your life, living as that steward, looking for every opportunity to make Jesus famous. When you embrace the biblical reality that everything you have, everything you are, is from heaven, when you embrace the biblical reality that your life is designed to make Jesus famous and look like the glorious Savior that he is, these two bookends, it's all from God, And it's all for God. These bookends hold up that middle book, that middle point that we now live helping others find their joy in Jesus. The heart of born again ministry is Jesus because it's all about Jesus. Jesus himself, he is central and he ought to be and only can be the animating principle or person of your life. And so I say to this church body, how about you? Are you more characterized as serving or being served in this church family? All things being equal. There's stages and seasons of life. Are you known for finding your joy in others' joy in Jesus? Or are you more known for trying to just bring out your own joy in life apart from Jesus. Friends, that's the temptation for all of us. The remaining sin in our lives wants to seduce us to looking back and looking after ourselves when our life is meant to be to to spend and be spent for the Lord. So I ask you, friends, are you using this stage of life and this season of life as an excuse not to build up this church and the body of Christ? Or are you using this stage and season of life as the Lord provides as a platform to serve the Lord and cultivate joy in Jesus and others? Can you agree with the Apostle Paul? 2 Corinthians 12, 15. 2 Corinthians 12, 15. The Apostle says, I will most gladly What do you think he's going to say? I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? Uh, The Christian life in one sense in one sense, is about burnout. You're going to crash right into that kingdom. Many of you in this room are retired, and I have a job for you. Jesus has a job for you. It is so easy in seasons of life, many children underfoot, many grandchildren underfoot, empty nesters, single life, wherever you are, This is what God has given you, both the sweet and the bitter. And the sweet and the bitter are both designed to shape you further into the image of Christ. And in doing so, for you to live outside of yourself for cultivating joy in Jesus, in others, for Jesus, to the glory of God. Church, all ministry is from God, to God, and for God. And there is work to do here, right now, by the Spirit, for the Spirit, for the fame of Jesus' name, and that begins in this place. Do you know the needs of your church? And are you willing to inconvenience yourself and step out of your comfort zone to help meet those needs? Because it's your joy. It's your joy. It was Jesus' joy on that evening to take off his outer garment 
put that towel around his waist and wash the feet of the disciples who were about to betray him and run away from him and fall asleep in Gethsemane. And what did Jesus tell them? You've seen what I've done. I've given you a model to do this to others. That's what he's calling us to do. And now do you see the beauty of the logic of Jesus here? If every single person in this room is focused on spending and being spent for the Lord, if I'm pouring myself out on behalf of others, what are others doing for me? Pouring themselves into me to strengthen me. And then the life of a local church begins to reflect the Trinity. Because the Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father, and the Father and Son love the Spirit, and the Spirit loves the Father and the Son. And, and there's this other orientedness in the Trinity when we become known for being more concerned about others because it's joy in Jesus and cultivating that joy, then well, that's a compelling community. It's a community that's empowered by the gospel. So if you hear these words and you, and you, and you, you see that your, your joy of cultivating joy in others for Jesus is dim, the antidote is not guilt. The antidote for all of the Christian life is more gospel. It's going back to the gospel, seeing all the salvation the Savior provides, looking about, at how much He loves you, and in loving you when we see that what He has done to bring us from darkness to life, from death to life, from to be born again, then that moves us to then being about the Lord's business in each other's lives, cultivating joy. Amen? Amen? Lord, we pray that you would do that in your Son. Lord, we, we love the gospel. We, we are we're shocked at the grace that you pour out upon us. But Lord, we don't love the gospel, and we're not shocked by your grace. We get used to it. But you know that, Lord, and that's why you've given us new hearts and filled us with your Spirit. That's why you're the patient Father who loves us and in your inscrutable wisdom are using pain and suffering and joy and happy times and sickness and in health and all things you're using to shape us into the image of Jesus, to trust Jesus by the Spirit, to make Jesus famous. So would you, Lord, in this church family, in each of us individually and us corporately, would you give us that double portion grace of that people when they drive by this building they know that jesus is made famous here and that when people interact with us at work and homes and and wherever we are that they would get a, a greater sense of you and your love for them jesus through us we can't do that on our own lord unless your spirit pours out that grace and love in us your grace and truth leaving it to ourselves we'll mess it up we'll focus on ourselves so god here we are Send us, give us those hearts to be spent and be sent before the Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.